It's Thursday. We're almost through the week, and you're tuned into the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. We've got a great show lined up for you again tonight. We are going to talk about uh, a story that a lot of you may not be familiar with. You've heard of many of the United States' most famous UFO sightings, crashes, and stories. We've heard of the Rendlesham Forest, which is often considered the uh, UK version of our Roswell. Well, did you know that our, our buddies up to the north, well, they, they had a very prominent crash, a very prominent UFO sighting, and we're going to talk about that tonight, the 1967 Shag Harbor UFO incident. Uh, this is the 50th anniversary of this year, which is weird, tying in 70 years this year as well for uh, for Roswell. Joining us is Jordan Bonaparte, and he is a writer, producer, and host of the Nighttime Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Jordan. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Dave. It's uh, great to great to be here. I love your show. Um, sad that Tim can't be here to talk to us, but I'm glad to uh, to have you all to myself. Well, thank you. He's getting healthy. Hopefully, he'll uh, he'll be back and and uh, running strong with us on a regular basis on the show instead of just Mondays. But I'm I'm pleased that you're able to join us and uh, talk to us about this. You know, th- this is interesting to me, right? 1967 Shag Harbor UFO incident. No coincidence. It's the same year I was born. Could I be an alien? Maybe, maybe not. There's no real telling. But uh, talk to us a little bit about this case. And, and again, it's kind of referred to as Canada's Roswell. Why mm. is that? Yeah, it's funny. Uh, a, a lot of people don't know about this case, and I think that's just because it's it's in Canada, and, and a lot of you know incredible things happen here, but news of them just for whatever reason has a hard, has a hard time crossing the border. Now we call it Canada's Roswell because here in Canada, it's our most well known sighting, um, talked about all around uh, all around the country. It's uh, just like you know Roswell, the, the Roswell that you have. It's uh, ours has been, our Shag Harbor sighting had been investigated by the government, by the the Navy, uh, by the, the the Coast Guard was there on site. RCMP, which is our our police, were on site. So it's um it's well documented. It has a, a lot of eyewitnesses that are unrelated and really have no i no purpose to um, work together to you know come up with some uh, hoax or something like that so it's just no matter which way you cut it the shag harbor incident is uh, is highly credible and it's a uh, it's a hell of a story all right what what drew you to this story why are you so fascinated by it well i, I really think what what fascinates me with the story is the the credibility of the witnesses this is something where when we get into the story i'll explain but but really um it's you hear a lot of ufo sightings where there's you know two people alone in the woods or four people together or whatnot and they see something um in this case it's a lot of individuals who have hardly any relation to each other yet they're all telling the same story um as it would all play out the rcmp who who again are our police officers the coast guard as they all come to the site they all see the same thing all file reports saying a very similar story and in the end nothing was ever solved so it's whether you believe it was a ufo or a you know a secret um, experimental aircraft or whatnot whatever you think it is you know something happened there in shag harbor there's there's no denying that and and i think for that reason alone just the amount of witnesses and the credibility of them it, it just makes it a, fascinating to me why talk about it now though jordan why bring this up just because it's the 50th anniversary is there new findings what what do you really have for this yeah well there's there's a lot going on right now for one yeah it's the 50th anniversary on october 4th uh this year it's the the 50th anniversary of this and and there's just a lot planned for it there's um the the community there's the, the shag harbor ufo incident society and they run a museum and an interpretive center where they share all the news clippings uh you know f- that have um been in been in existence over the 50 years since this happened uh so there's just a lot going on there they're going to have a big festival this year where people from all over canada are going to go to uh to celebrate it i guess and, and commemorate it and learn a bit about it and meet some of the eyewitnesses um so it's it's just a with the 50th anniversary coming it's just a great time to talk about it and it's a great time for people like a lot of your listeners to to learn about you know how how incredible of a sighting this is that they you know probably don't know much about now you've actually on your show uh the nighttime podcast you've spoken to an eyewitness 
uh, Lori Wickens. Is that correct? Yeah, I was uh, fortunate where when I first started researching it, I, like I had basically grown up with this story because I, I don't live far from there. I I had had always known the basics of it, but when I decided to cover it on my show, I wanted to get in touch with some of the living eyewitnesses. And the, the person who's most closely associated with the sighting is, is Lori Wickens. He was actually the local fisherman who, when the object crashed into the into the harbor, he was the one who saw it, one of the ones who saw it, and was the first to report it to the RCMP. So, so I, I, want, I reached out to him through uh, some mutual connections we have, and he agreed to meet me for coffee. And I had actually sat down with him at a Tim Hortons, which is a very Canadian way to meet someone. And I just recorded him, and, and he basically told me what he remembers of the whole story. And, I, and I'll tell you, um, you when you think of an, a UFO eyewitness, Laurie Wickens would be the last person you would you would ever think up. He's a um, born and raised in Shag Harbor, which is a tiny little spot in the middle of nowhere. Uh, he's been a fisherman his whole life, and he is just would be the last person on earth that you would you would expect to make up you know stories of uh, a UFO sighting. He's uh, would be probably the most down to earth guy I ever met. And what was his? telling i mean walk us through this and as you're sitting there face to face talking about this do you ever get the feel that there's any kind of manipulation of the story going on or you know or are you sensing the reality and the resonance of his his experience yeah well with with lori uh lori wickens i don't feel like there's any exaggeration at all if anything i feel like he may be um, understating some of the things that happened just because he's such a, a practical type of guy. But basically, I'll, I'll tell you kind of his, his, the story he told me. And a lot of people, when they hear of the Shag Harbor incident, they hear of it through Lori's point of view, where again, he was, he's kind of the guy most closely associated with it because again, he was the one to make the first police report. So his name appears in a lot of the newspaper articles and the, the government reports that were, um, that were put together surrounding this. But basically as the, as the story plays out from, for Lori, I think at the time he was about 17 years old and Lori Wickens and four of his friends were, were in his car. It was about 1130 at night. And they were leaving a, a dance that had happened in, in their small town. They're basically driving through um, an area where it's heavily forested. They're on a road that's kind of on the water. Um, one side is water. The other side is the forest. And they're just driving across the high, uh, along the highway, basically on their way back towards Shag Harbor. As they're driving on their right side above the tree line, they see a series of lights in the sky that seem to be traveling almost um, parallel, like almost along with them. And the lights seem to be kind of flashing on and off, one after the other, all tinted a yellowish color. Uh, their their thought initially was that what they were seeing was the like the lights that would be on the wings of like a passenger jet. Like they'll have like the you know the lights that are just flashing on the plane. Uh, their first thought when they saw it, kind of as it popped in and out of the tree line, was that they were surprised that there was a plane that low to the ground and that there was a plane that bright in you know in this area because there's not like an airport or anything in this part of the province. So as they were driving and the road was you know. Um, turning along uh, with the with the shape of the coastline, the lights would randomly rise and, and drop above and below the, the tree line on their right. Um, Lori began concern, became concerned when the lights seemed to be slowly descending, and they were really concerned that, you know, why would a plane be this low? So they started to speed up the car because – Further up ahead, I think a couple kilometers above where they, uh, ahead of where they were initially, the the road would open up a little bit. So they were speeding to try to get up there to get a better look at what was in the sky. And basically, when they came upon that area where the the, the tree line lowered and the whole area opened up further, they saw the lights travel from the tree line over their car and descend directly into the water that was on the left-hand side of them. And they des he described it as almost being like the sound of, like, basically of a plane crash. He just heard, whoosh, and he described it as sounding almost like a bomb hitting the water. It was so dark that they couldn't see, like, the splash, but they could see in the water 
the lights that they saw from the sky still glowing underneath the water, like underneath the um, the, the surface of the water, although it, it was probably about a kilometer out from the shoreline. But it was apparent to them that those lights, whatever it was, crossed them into the water, and whatever it is is now under the water, and they could you know, see the lights. Now, did so you say leading up to this coming down, mm-hmm. was there a boom, a crash, a shot, anything that would lead us to understand why this might be coming down so hard? No, there was, it didn't make a sound until the point that it that it hit the water they said it was completely silent in the sky and he even had his window down you know expecting to hear like a plane just above kind of the ground like you know he he told me he felt like it was probably anywhere from from 100 to 200 300 feet above above the ground so it it, you know it was really low but uh where, where the story really picks up is again they see it hit the water they see the lights under the water. In their mind, what they had just seen was probably a passenger aircraft land into the water. And in their mind, there's probably people out there, you know, fighting for their life to survive. Right. So what he did was he, he drove um, just about another kilometer up the road from where this happened. There was a small gas station with a payphone out front. So he drove up to that, picked up the payphone, and called the local police. And when he reported to the police, again, this is about a 16, 17-year-old guy just about midnight on a um, calling the police to say he thought he saw a plane crash in you know the middle of nowhere Nova Scotia the person answering uh, asked him if he had been drinking if he had been doing drugs you know trying to figure out what was going on and they weren't taking him very seriously but while he was on the phone being asked if he was drunk um, several more calls were coming into the police basically reporting the same thing from other people who live in and around the area because where it where it hit the water there was kind of a couple homes on an embankment there so multiple people had seen this and when all those calls came in all within a matter of a minute or two uh, the person who had Lori on the phone realized you know something special is going on and they asked Lori to go back to where he saw to the shoreline where he saw the object into the water and they were going to dispatch some police to go meet with them and you know and take a look themselves so it's uh and And that's got to be and and yeah it doesn't seem weird i mean was there any kind of speed being put into this i mean it sounds like they were kind of lackadaisical about the whole situation if a plane really did just come down into a body of water yeah well at first they weren't taking him very seriously but when multiple calls came in you know it was you know something was going on and that was when it became serious and when they asked him to go back to the shoreline to you know to point out what he had seen there was uh, multiple rcmp officers i believe every rcmp officer in this area was sent out to uh, to meet lori and when they all get on the the shoreline he's you know with the police officers he's pointing out to the water and he still has his friends with him and at this point a couple people who live in the area are starting to gather as well and they're pointing out and from a couple cl- a kilometer or two out they could see still again these lights under the water and they seem to be slowly dimming um, and again, what they're thinking is it's probably the plane slowly sinking under its own weight. So what they ended up doing, again, I mentioned Lori's a fisherman. Basically, everyone in this area is a fisherman. So what they did was they uh, commandeered a couple uh, small fishing boats. Uh, they called the Coast Guard as well, but it would take some time for the Coast Guard to respond. But what they did in these small fishing boats, uh, the a couple police officers, Lori and his friends, and a few other local fishermen, they uh, drove their boats out to where the lights were seen to be descending into the water. Uh, in their mind, again, they had ropes with them. They thought they were going to be just pulling people out of the water and saving lives. But when they got to the scene of where they saw the light, the light at this point had diminished um, and was completely out of sight. But what they described finding, rather than people fighting for their lives to you know to survive in the water, what they found was a thick foam that seemed to cover um, almost in a big circle, uh, nearly a kilometer wide. Uh, this thick foam that was unlike any sea foam they've ever they've ever seen. And again, these are local fishermen who are in the area all the time and would have a lot of experience with the waters. And anyone who's been around water like this, you've seen like soapy sea foam kind of on the shoreline. But they describe this as, as being like a, a thick pasty thing that you could almost like if you put like a a butter knife off the side of your boat you could almost scoop it up and you know spread it over bread like they said it was a a thick sulfuric smelling foam 
although there was no people in there, just a strange foam. Did anybody take samples of this foam yeah. to be tested? Uh, I wish they had. A, that's one thing that, you know, when the story is told and talked about, a lot of people would love to get their hands on some of that foam for testing now. At the time, um, I don't think they realized how special and important that may have been, but they didn't uh, take any samples. All they did was, uh, Lori uh, said uh, the police officer in the boat with them, I think, was the one who uh, scooped up a handful of it and smelt it and trying to figure out, you know, maybe it's uh, – jet fuel that came out of the plane because still at this point they're still they're still on the assumption that it was an airplane so they were initially thinking it just had something to do with the the fuel that would have been in the in the uh, in the plane but the problem was again thinking that there's a plane slowly sinking in in the dark water uh, it's at the middle of the night now and it's it's pitch black out there so they had no option to send divers down so basically their plan and, and where it ends on the first night is their plan is the next morning search and rescue is going to send some divers and they're going to go down to the bottom of the water to, you know, see what they find down there. Again, this seems pretty lackadaisical. You would think that they would have gotten the FAA or somebody, you know, the Canadian version involved in this. There would have been a, a quicker search and rescue if there mm-hmm. really was some kind of craft that was down in this water. Yeah, and I think they they still had some doubts, although they did respond and send several police and search and rescue out there. There was no sign of missing aircraft. There was, you know, no planes were reported missing. This happened in an area where there wouldn't be a lot of air traffic. So the whole thing really just didn't make sense from the beginning. And I question if that's maybe why the reaction wasn't stronger. Although for the following, you know, this happened in the middle of the night, but for the next two or three days, there would be a presence on the shoreline there of the next morning was the coast guard sent divers down and they went right across the the bottom of the harbor and didn't find anything yet um the next day and the following day the uh, the canadian navy was um was sending uh rumored to be submarines although there hadn't been any um definitive proof of that with any of the documentation but they were sending divers in uh, over the next several days and in the end what they had put together was basically a report to the that the canadian government drew up that basically said they ruled out every possible outcome and what's unique about this report is this is one of the first reports where on a government document they say it's a uh, like a, a legitimate ufo sighting again they mean unidentified flying object because right. they weren't able to uh, identify it but they ruled out flares uh, a downed aircraft because nothing turned out they they tried basically everything they could and have never been able to to solve what this is well okay divers come out they go down there's nothing absolutely nothing although there are people who would tell you that they saw that like there are some rumors that Late at night, there were trucks um, that were loaded, and the trucks drove away. Maybe that would lead you to believe that they pulled, you know, a flying saucer out of the water or something. But those reports, I don't know how credible they are, and I have never met anyone who um, who admits to seeing anything like that happened. Did they ever run tests on the water, even in the the ensuing years? Because I would guess if there was some kind of heavy chemical released into the water. Mm-hmm there should be some properties of it that would not be native to that to that area mhm that's a, that's a good thought i had never heard of anything beyond divers again this is 50 years ago so i don't know what would stick around as well as again where this is an area where those waters have been fished for hundreds of years there's probably a lot of oil and gas and all sorts of weird stuff that has made its way into those waters just from you know the the amount of boats that are coming and going, but right. um, but I have never heard of any type of testing. Although it would be interesting, and it's funny where the foam they found was described as you know being a sulfuric orange, a sulfuric smelling orange foam. In a lot of these types of stories, you hear about you know the smell of sulfur or the taste of sulfur in these types of sightings. So I just I, I find that interesting that. That that's how it came out, and you know, and when I talk about Lori Wickens, the the that first eyewitness being a really down to earth guy, when I talk to him, it's obvious he's not 
um, invested in you know the the UFO lore, where he doesn't really know the. It's almost like uh, talking to him was kind of like you know like talking to your grandfather about UFOs. They just don't kind of know the words or really get it. Uh, he's kind of like that. So I couldn't see him pulling things out of the uh, like the zeitgeist that we use when talking about UFOs. Uh, he just doesn't seem like he would have the background to do that. All right. Now talk to me about Chris Stiles. Introduce our, mm-hmm. our audience to Chris Stiles and and uh, his role in the Shag Harbor incident. Yeah, Chris Stiles is uh, an incredible UFO researcher, possibly Canada's best. Um, and really, uh, this may not come across as strongly to your to your listeners that don't know the story, but again, here in Canada, the Shag Harbor incident is a is a big deal, and and it's really it's Chris Stiles' baby. Where basically this all happened in 1967. There was a couple news articles about whether or not there was a UFO crashed. There was a you know a, a couple days worth of searching and found nothing. And basically the story dropped off until the early 90s when Chris Stiles, uh, uh, at this point an up and coming UFO researcher, he was working for MUFON at the time as a as a field investigator. Uh, he was going through um, archives and looking at historical UFO sightings from the Nova Scotia area and came across, you know, this thing that happened in Shag Harbor back in 67, and he decided to reopen an investigation into it. Um, so it started with, at this point in the early 90s, not many people were talking about this. Uh, when Chris started digging into it, though, he's just kind of like um, like the most dog-nosed guy. He was just, you know, digging deep. He was through the Freedom of Information Act and or Canada's equivalent, he was getting a lot of the government documents and basically everything he was getting in was it was kind of just intriguing him more and more to dig further and further. So as he started digging, speaking to eyewitnesses, the the picture and the story that we now know about Shag Harbor is basically what surfaced. And he then uh, released a couple books on the topic. Um, most um, most famously, a book called Dark Object that was uh, put out through Whitley Strieber's um, uh, book company. But that was a, a big book when that came out, and that was really what. Uh, put shag harbor on the map so when you're talking about shag harbor you're really talking about the incredible work chris styles did to piece this all together as one you know cohesive story with piles of data and evidence to back it up i I had met him when i had done my episode uh, on the nighttime podcast i had he invited me to his house and agreed to tell me the story and at that point i didn't know too much about him but um Everything about dealing with Chris seemed to me like something out of an X Files episode. Like he, uh, at first, all of our emails back and forth, he was really short with me, and I was thinking, you know, this guy really doesn't like me. And then when he um, invited me to his house, uh, I was like, oh, and maybe he does like me, and he's maybe just a rude guy. But when I showed up at his house, I realized he is the real deal. He's a older guy, I would guess, probably around his sixties, big long beard, kind of like Santa Claus. He lives in a small house where pretty much every room had from ceiling to uh, from floor to ceiling stacks of papers and books that were covered in dust. And it was all UFO stuff. Even in his kitchen, on his kitchen table, there was stacks of books from the 50s, 60s and 70s about UFOs. And it was just like, again, it was like a set from an X-Files episode. But this guy just lives in a house surrounded by uh, government documents that he's pouring over in books about UFOs. So he's uh, quite an incredible guy and maybe a future guest. Uh, I think he'd get a kick out of talking to him. I'd love to. Uh, so talk yeah. to me about it. When you sit down with this guy to, to hear his thoughts and theories and beliefs on this, what does he open up and talk to you about? Well, he's, and, and I'm, I'm sure you've spoke to a lot of people like this, where he is so deep down the rabbit hole that it's almost like going to a doctor that's you know like a brain specialist and asking them to explain you know uh, the surgery they do in layman's terms but they're you know just so far above your level that it's hard to even uh, you know get on the same wavelength as them i kind of felt at a bit like that like when i was talking to him he was 
quickly referencing, you know, uh, dates and technical names for these government documents. Um, I'm making it up, but he could be like, you know, it's I got this C-342 document and it's, you know, it's not dated in the right format. And, you know, this general is not a general. He was a this and, you know, and all this stuff for Chris. He just lives in that world. So I found speaking to him was a bit intimidating because I go into the my interest in UFOs and UFO stories is pretty entry level. I find the stories compelling. I really enjoy talking to the people and, you know, it's always interesting. But Chris was like a scientist of, of UFO sightings. Uh, he knew everything about the way governments put documents together. He knew every, I bet you this guy knows every UFO sighting that has happened in Canadian history, as well as every researcher that was ever involved in any of it. Uh, so when you're talking to him, that, that makes it difficult. But at the same time, he's used to talking to people who, um, who either don't believe him or question him or try to prove him wrong. So anything he tells you, he backs it up with an incredible amount of information. It's almost like, um, uh, this, um, Darwin, he wrote the book, uh, The Origin of Species, and he proved, uh, or he made a case for evolution back in the day. Uh, he spent so much time, Darwin spent like his, his life putting this book together, The Origin of Species, so that way the, um, People who didn't believe him, they couldn't really argue it because he made such a strong case for, you know, evolution existing. I kind of feel like Chris Stiles is like the UFO version of Darwin, where he's spending an incredible amount of time making it so that you can't really argue with him because he's thought it out and he's like a 100 steps ahead of you. So in the end, I'm just I have nothing but respect for him. And I'm I'm glad to live in a world where there are people like Lori Wickens who are put, or sorry, where there's people like Chris Stiles who are putting that much effort into something as, uh, as interesting as UFO research. Now, how many craft total came down? Was it just the one craft that was seen crashing into this area? Yeah, that's another interesting part of this is there was only one craft seen crashing into Shag Harbor. So the actual Shag Harbor incident is this one craft landing into the water. However, there, in the days leading up to the Shag Harbor incident, there was what Chris Stiles and a lot of other researchers refer to as a flap, which is just basically an increase in UFO sightings and activity that they say uh, was all around uh, eastern Canada, the, basically the provinces and the part of Canada surrounding Nova Scotia where this happened. Um, in the book, Dark Object, they have a whole series of sightings leading up to that that seem to be increasing in severity and or basically boldness. And a lot of these sightings on their own are fascinating and include um, interesting people like uh, like pilots and, you know, in government, um, uh, the 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 Air Force have uh, two two documented sightings where they came had some close calls in the sky. But. Basically, in the days leading up to Shag Harbor, there were sightings um, in increasing frequency all across this part of Canada. But it seemed to be the night of the actual Shag Harbor incident, October 4th. That was when things were the, the most intense. And um, after that, it really cooled down right afterwards. So whatever was going on in the skies, it was basically late September up until October 4th. And then that was it. Well, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll continue with Jordan Bonaparte as we discuss the Shag Harbor incident and the research, the findings, the stories. We'll do that when we return to the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. Beyond the Darkness. All right, welcome back to the show. This is Beyond the Darkness. Jordan Bonaparte, my guest, as we're talking about the Shag Harbor UFO incident from 1967, the 50th anniversary. Now, you, you briefly touched on the fact that at one point, maybe the Navy was interested in investigating a Russian submarine, which had entered Canadian waters nearby. What was the final outcome of that? Did they ever get any conclusive information about that? And, and I don't know, do, do submarines light up? Yeah, there's, it's, it's funny when you, when you get into the submarines, there's so many different stories as to 
what was happening under the water in the days after it. Some were saying Russian submarines. Some were saying, um, or some believe it was Canadian submarines actually chasing a, um, a USO, like an unidentified submerged object. But really, uh, of everything I've heard about what was happening under the water or what could have happened that night, the most compelling explanation I've ever heard heard for shag harbor and and i don't know if this is the one i believe but this is probably the one i'd put my money on if i had to bet is uh this came from um another ufo researcher named chris rutkowski who's a another well-known canadian ufo researcher uh he's what kind of the main proponent of uh of, of this theory and basically it's there's something Again, where this happened back in 67 was at the height of the, of the Cold War. So there was a lot of satellites and spying and, you know, all that kind of stuff going on. But there was something called the Corona satellite. And this was a satellite high up in the sky, of course, that would be sent over, you know, Russia and that part of the world to take high resolution photos for surveillance. And then when the satellite made its way back over my part of the world, it would drop, and again, this is before digital cameras, so it had film in a canister, and it would drop the canister from the sky, it would land into the Atlantic Ocean, a submarine would scoop it up and drive it to, you know, the military base to be, to have the film developed and look at what, you know, people over in that side of the world were up to. Um, it was, it is believed that the Corona satellite was dropping the film canisters with a flare and a small little, um, uh, parachute around uh, not too far from where Shag Harbor is. So some people believe what they may have seen, what Lori Wickens and, and the crew driving may have seen was the, the film canister with a flare hitting the water. I don't know if that would explain the foam, but I have heard people say if you drop certain types of flares into salt water, uh, the, the chemical in the flare will react with the water with the water and that could happen, it would create the foam. And that would also explain a slowly descending light into the water. Maybe what they were seeing was the flare slowly, you know, fading out or slowly sinking. So that's, uh, that's one theory. And I think that one hits a lot of the points where, you know, that makes a lot of sense. But there are people who are very into this that would tell you that, that's not at all what happened and it certainly wasn't a flare but it's uh someone like me who's not an expert in any of it i find myself kind of just standing in the middle not sure what to believe but fascinated by the entire thing yeah i I get that too and it's it's intriguing what a weird twist on all of this now tell me about the shag harbor festival well how long has this Mm -hmm. been going on and what all is involved in that yeah, it's uh it's a really cool time. It's the Shag Harbor Festival is really nowadays just about the only thing that happens in Shag Harbor. This is a really tiny place and you know, if you were driving past, you would never notice it. You would drive right past Shag Harbor. But I have a feeling, Dave, if you were driving there, you would notice it because they have a uh, signs on the uh, on the highway like pointing there saying like this is um, the site of the famous 1967 ufo sighting so it's kind of cool to see that type of sign when you're driving down the highway but basically what they do and this has been on and off for probably the last 15 or 20 years or so they'll have a festival every year it's called just the shag harbor incident festival uh, that the shag harbor ufo incident society puts on and usually what it involves is a lot of people dressing up as aliens uh, there's usually a big dance there's often bands playing the stores will decorate themselves and you know in ufo you know themes or whatnot People will often set up fake UFO crashes on their front lawns. So the whole little town just turns into this crazy place for, you know, a weekend. Uh, this year, with it being the 50th, they had really big plans to make it bigger and better than ever. Um, for your listeners in, in the United States or elsewhere in the world, this is Canada's 150th birthday. Um, Canada, we call it Canada Day. It's coming up actually this next weekend, our 150th birthday. But what the Canadian government is doing to commemorate their 150th birthday is they offered a lot of grants to small communities to put something together to, you know, for the community to get involved in. Uh, one of the things was the Shag Harbor UFO incident. They thought they, with it being the 50th anniversary, 
they would have an easy time getting some government money to make this a really special year. So um, they thought they were pretty much a shoe in because I guess the last several years they had no problem getting enough money to from the government to make this happen. Um, so they were planning. They had all these big plans. Things were going to be great. But I guess at the last minute, all of the funding that they were expecting from these Canada, Canada 150 grants, as well as the different grants they got in the U years prior, for whatever reason, the rug was kind of pulled out from under them, and they didn't get anything. And it was initially looking like the whole thing wasn't going to happen. There was actually, um, the news had picked up on it, um, because I guess uh, some of the organizers of the Shag Harbor uh, Festival were crying foul because uh, some of the, the other communities that got grants were, just to give you an idea of how silly some of them were, I think one town got $90,000 to do an outdoor snakes and ladders thing where they had painted the you know the roads like snakes and ladders and again paid 90 grand and there was just big money that the government dished out to all these small communities to put on things so when the shag harbor didn't get any money they kicked up a stink and it led to just a couple news articles not a big deal at all just again a few articles and then a couple of the the sites that commonly cover ufo sightings kind of picked those up and that was basically it uh, it was looking like the it, the festival was going to be canceled, and all this happened just about two months ago. But then what was really weird was just after all that news um, played out, I don't know a lot about this, but I guess an anonymous donor, a mysterious person, um, stepped in and basically saved the entire festival um, basically with an anonymous donation. So when... The festival organizers didn't get the money from the government. Some random civilian stepped up, offered them an uh, undisclosed amount of money. Um, now the festival is happening, and it's going to be fantastic. But what's really cool is this mysterious donor uh, asked the Incident Society not to share any information about them, but they provided um, – uh, just kind of a, a puzzling statement that they want it released. So when this when this donation happened and saved the festival, things just blew up around here, and you know the Canadian media and the international media was all reporting on you know this mysterious donor and who this could be and what they could mean with their their vague statement. What, and what was the vague statement? <laughs> Yeah, I I'm actually have it in front of me here. I just, as we were talking earlier, I pulled up some of the articles. So it's basically a paragraph, and here's what it says. <clears throat> it says, although there there is much I can't reveal, without any hesitation, I can say the Canadian government and the international community it answers to appears to be concealing what happened in and around the waters of Shag Harbor, Canada, on October 4th, 67. People with the connections, notoriety, and finances are working hard to challenge how we view the world around us. And Shag Harbor is one of the smoking guns that will be used to achieve this. And that's it. So it's Dan Aykroyd. <laughs> it's funny you said that. I, I oh, Several people had uh, – I, I had uh, been watching people online talking about it and listening to a few other like podcasts covering it. And Dan Aykroyd was one of the names that came uh, – that was thrown around a lot because, again, he's a Canadian with a lot of notoriety and definitely has the finances. And he's known to be uh, very into the UFO lore. So who knows? It could be him. I've also heard people um, guessing it could be uh, – Tom DeLonge, which is the like the ex singer of Blink One Eighty Two, he's really into UFO research as well. All right, that that's a good possibility. I just I know Dan's from Canada. Yeah, I know he and his family are big into the whole Fortean thing, and he is big into UFOs. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if to find out that it was him in yeah. the future. Yeah, and it's, it'd be the kind of thing, uh, like I could picture Dan Aykroyd being like, thinking it's cool that a small little community is putting on a festival and be like, I'm just going to save that festival. Right. But who, <laughs> but who, whoever stepped up and did it, like it's, it's fantastic because again, it was on its way to being canceled and now it's like, you know, they're firing on all cylinders. They have, 
they they are the people organizing it say it's going to be the uh, you know the festival to end all festivals. So it's uh, it's three days long now, and it's basically features a who's who of Canadian UFO researchers. It includes a lot of the original eyewitnesses, and I'm going to go because it's not too far from where I live. But one of the things that they're doing that's going to be really cool is um, they have a. Uh, tour bus. Uh, I don't know if it's one or two of them, but Lori Wickens and, a, and some of the people that were in the car with them, I believe, the the tour bus is going to retrace the path they went on. And Lori, I suppose, with like a microphone, is basically going to tell the story. Uh, but it's going to be on the 50th anniversary at the same time of day or all, of night, taking the same routes. So I- Wow, I think be that's going to cool. be a really cool experience. Yeah, it is. Holy cow! Yeah. Here's the deal, though. If there's so much interest and popularity, and the area is uh, accepting of this, why why were they struggling to have a conference there? I think for for them themselves, there's for one, there's just not a lot of money in you know in promoting UFO stories. Uh, it's a town where. It, again, it's the middle of nowhere fishing community. I don't know their population, but I'd be surprised if it's 500 people. So I, I'm thinking it's probably pretty hard for them to put anything on without a little with, without government assistance. Like even for a small like not for profit company to even get advertising to draw people in from you know out of this out of that area would you know that'd be pretty daunting. But I think it's it really luckily for, for them, the story is so compelling. And then there's people like us that are interested in hearing the story and, you know, and keeping it alive. What do the people of Nova Scotia feel about this? Is this something that they that they openly embrace like the people of Loch Ness or is this uh, something that they just kind of wish would go, go away? I think there's probably a pretty good mix of it. Almost like, again, in Nova Scotia, we have Oak Island. And Shag Harbor and Oak Island kind of get very similar responses. You have your people like me who are, you know, who grew up with the stories and are fascinated by it. And I kind of cherish Shag Harbor and Oak Island as, you know, something that makes my province special and intriguing to people all over the world. But you would also talk to people from Nova Scotia who, if you mentioned Shag Harbor and Oak Island, would think that those stories embarrass us. And instead, we should, um, you know, promote our hockey players and, you know, and these sorts of uh, contributions we make to society. Uh, I have heard a lot of people who believe that Shag Harbor, as well as Oak Island, are just people from the area trying to perpetuate a myth to you know for either financial or you know or or maybe just attention or some type of gain although i i disagree with that but i could see as some why some would say that and then what i always find surprising is people from the area who have who know next to nothing about these stories um i talk to people all the time who I'll bring up Shag Harbor or Oak Island or any other incredible thing that's happened here. And I'll just see some people with just a, you know, they just give me a blank stare back and they're like, you know, what are you talking about? Um, so I'm, I'm not a hit at parties when I bring up the Shag Harbor UFO sighting, but, uh, really you would, all right. I would think they'd, <laughs> they'd be fascinated still about that whole aspect. What are some of the top theories regarding this incident. I mean, you know, that there, there has to be still some buzz and talk still going on. And, you know, you had, was it your Canadian prime minister that was so open and talking about UFOs and, and the work that your, your country, you know, seemed to be open to that whole concept. Where do they stand on this, on this story now? Yeah, it's, it's, as far as theories, they're broad and wide ranging. Uh, you have all sorts. A lot of people believe that this is a smoking gun uh, that points towards uh, alien life visiting Earth. Some people believe that and believe for whatever reason they wanted to get in the water uh, and spend some time down there because there is some um, some stories of in the days after the crash. People report it seeing uh, an object leave the water and, you know, head off into the sky. It was actually, I think, about four or five days after the crash. Um, the story is somebody who lives in the area was getting really bad reception out of nowhere on their on their television. So they went outside to adjust the um, 
like the the dish or whatever, like the you know what I'm talking about, the dish to receive the right. signal. Uh, and when he went outside to adjust his his dish, he saw something leave the water, uh, very similar style, like basically a line of lights come out of the water and just head off into the sky. So some people believe it was some kind of craft that spent some time under the water and left. So but yet avoided and evaded the searchers and and the divers. Yeah. Exactly. Um, some Do you think maybe will, this was just the him his way of you know I don't want you idiots hanging around my property and out here messing up our water. So I saw it leave. It's no longer yeah, here. Move on. <laughs> uh, if so, I like I like the guy who decided to do that to get rid of all the UFO researchers. Right. <laughs> I saw it. It left. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, um, nothing left to research. Yeah. Did it, they ever it, do any notice? I mean, at the bottom of the the lake, was there? A landing area was there. There has down there. There has been no. Um, no one has ever said they found anything out of the ordinary in the water. And I've heard of again the diving that went on shortly, like in the days just after the crash. But even recently, there has been people who who um, just amateur divers uh, would go down there looking for any sign of wreckage or anything unusual. And there has been nothing unusual found down there. So that's I, I think that that's just a part of the mystery. Like I think when you when you stack it all up, there's no question that something strange happened that night. There's too many people that are that have nothing to gain by associating themselves with the UFO phenomenon. Because again, we're not talking about a town full of sci-fi writers and, you know, fans of fantasy novels. Uh, people like Lori Wickens, when you meet him, he is a fisherman. And that's the only way you could describe him. He's just the type of guy that could take apart a motor and put it back together if it meant he was going to catch more fish that day. Um, not the kind of guy who would be making up these sorts of stories. And you could say the same thing for all the, a lot of the other people who saw it. The police were on the scene. The Coast Guard were on the scene. So again, I think without question and no debate, something happened that night. They haven't found proof of it in the water, and if they did, they're not sharing that information. And by they, I mean the search and rescue, the Coast Guard, or the Canadian Navy. Um, if it's the Corona satellite, that theory, I could see why maybe they would want to keep that hush-hush out of the interest of national security. Right. But, you know, we're 50 years later now, and the Cold War is long from over. Um, although it seems to be heating up again. Yeah, but <laughs> the Cold War is, colding, is getting chillier, it seems. Yeah, um, but you would think like if if the government knew something that they could you know release information and uh, and just shine a light on what actually happened. I don't know why they wouldn't, but it doesn't seem like that ever happens. Like I don't know if I can ever think of a story where even you know fifty years later the government's like, all right, here's what happened. So yeah, I, I don't know. Like as far as what happened there, I don't know if we'll ever figure it out. But I think. It's almost like, you know, what you have with Shag Harbor is just enough of the story to make the thing so compelling. It's almost like a really good movie that has like a cliffhanger at the uh, at the end. It's just people are going to talk about it forever. And no matter how convinced someone is of what they think happens, there's someone else like, you know, what Chris Stiles, who's going to be able to, you know, talk the way around it. And then there's probably someone who can talk the way around him. So it's, you know, with these UFO sightings, it's. Generally, there's not enough information to come with a, a conclusive explanation, but I think that's why it's great a great topic for discussion because it's just it's a it's a almost like a blank canvas, except instead of the canvas being completely blank, there's just a couple weird little things drawn on it. So no matter what else you lay on the canvas, it's going to end up being interesting. Talk to me a little bit about your show so people can find you and, and follow up with what you do as well. I, I think they'd be fascinated uh, so the listeners of our show can have another one. They're always seeking new audio and new uh, input from, from different places. Yeah. My, uh, my show is called The Nighttime Podcast. It's a podcast that I release uh, generally every second week. And what I do is uh, – my niche, uh, rather than covering a certain topic, is I generally cover stories from a certain area of Canada. So I live on the eastern side of Canada. So what I do is cover uh, things that have happened in my part of the country 
that I find fascinating. So common topics would be things like UFO sightings, unexplained archaeological sites. I do true crime um, stories, so uh, basically historical retrospectives of uh, of crimes that have happened in my part of the country. I cover as well, um, my show is probably most known for its continued coverage of um, of a missing person named Emma Filipov. She was a girl who uh, disappeared from a busy intersection um, after speaking to police uh, now going on five years ago. I've been covering her case uh, over a series of episodes with the help of her mother and some of her close friends. So basically, if... if it's hard to even describe my show, but if, if it's a story that's interesting to me, I will research everything I can about it and share it with my listeners. And the best way to find me is I'm on iTunes. I'm on, you know, anywhere where podcasts are. If you search nighttime podcast, you'll find me. But I'm also very active on Facebook and Twitter where my handle is at nighttime pod. Talk to me about some of the cool um kind of weird archaeological finds. Uh, that's something that fascinates me as well. What have you covered before? Yeah, it's um, aside from Oak Island, I, I guess you could consider that archaeological. But one of the ones that I'm most interested in, it's um, people who listen to your show likely would never have heard of this because it's it's just a spot right by my house. It's We call it the Bears Lake Mystery Walls. And basically what it is is Bears Lake is an industrial park uh, like a lot of people who are listening in your town, you probably have an area just outside of town where in the last 20 years or so they cleared it out and put a bunch of big box stores and maybe a movie theater and an IKEA or something like that out there. In Halifax, Nova Scotia, where I live, Bears Lake is one of our industrial parks where there's a theater and, you know, IKEA and these sorts of stores. But anyway, as they were clearing it out, they were taking aerial photographs, uh, photos from the sky to look at the lay of the land so they could plan where water is going to be diverted and where the roads would go. And when they're looking at these photos, this was just in the um, late 80s, they saw what appeared to be a structure in the middle of the woods where there was no need for no reason for there to be a structure. So they sent people in there to see what it was, assuming they would find maybe an old farmhouse or something like that. But instead of finding a farmhouse, what they found is um, – uh, a five-sided structure, which is made of stacked stone, so just rocks piled on top of rocks that are about a meter high and about a, about a meter thick. They, and also the site, aside from the five-sided structure, is a 150-meter-long wall that just traces across the uh, basically a cliffside. Um, and again, it's about a meter high and a meter wide of stacked stone. Uh, what's interesting about it, you would think it was probably uh, military fortifications or maybe something used for agricultural purposes, but the history of my city is fairly well documented, especially my city's military history, and there's no evidence of there ever being any type of activity in this part of the – what throughout the history of my city would have just been you know the middle of the woods um they've tried everything ground penetrating radar they've dug things trying to find any evidence of who built it why or how or when and it's been a it's absolutely stumped anyone who's tried to figure it out because again you can't do carbon dating because it's just a pile of rocks but they've, um, it's an absolute mystery who built it or why or what the purpose for it was. And what's really cool about it is as the city has grown, the city has basically grown around it. So you can be standing outside of you know, um, a major big box store and you just have to walk across the street and walk in the woods a couple steps and you come across this magical place that, you know, nobody can explain. So that's one that I've covered quite a bit. I had the some of the lead researchers and the guy who actually found it on my show to tell the story. But I think what draws me to that so much is I, I like to, and with my show and just with my life in general, I kind of, I find the world is such a boring place that I like to try to find any little thing that makes me feel like there's still some, you know, like mystery and magic left out there. And the Bears Lake Mystery Walls, for me, is perfect because it's right next to my house. 
But it also, you can be in the most boring place, like surrounded by big box stores, and you just have to walk across the street a couple steps into the woods, and all of a sudden you're in a scene that looks like something out of like an Indiana Jones book movie or something like that. So that's an example of a unexplained archaeological site that I that I cover. And I visit it all the time. I take my son for walks through there from time to time. That's awesome. For people that are not familiar with Oak Island, before I let you go, Give us kind of a, a, the insights of Oak Island and what is this big mystery that surrounds this? I've watched some of the episodes. I'm not even sure I really understand what the hell is going on on Oak Island at this point. Yeah, well, when you watch the show, it's it's tough because the show, it's uh, as the seasons have gone on, it's um, you really need to know your stuff to keep up with their, what they're doing. But basically, Oak Island is one of Nova Scotia's best known sites now mainly due to the success of uh, history channels show the curse of oak island but basically what it is is a small island in nova scotia um that on this island is the world's longest running treasure hunt it's now for the last 222 years almost continuously people have been buying the island or buying portions of the island and digging and looking for what they presume to be a treasure of some sort, but of serious significance under the ground. So it's been, again, going on for 222 years, and, and who, people have tried a variety. Is this, of, is this uh, the, yeah. the Knights Templar? Is it Blackbeard? Is it uh, Bob and Doug McKenzie? Who, who's burying their treasure in Oak <laughs> Island? <laughs> you know, that's that's the thing is, and just like Shag Harbor, everybody has a different story for it. Some people believe it's it's the Knights Templar that left something behind there. Um, some people think it is uh, even predates them. Some people think it is just a pirate, such as Black uh, Blackbeard or Captain Kidd, who left some kind of you know booty there. Uh, there's all sorts. Some people think it predates humanity and the some people believe it's the ancient egyptians who buried stuff there so it's um what's interesting about oak island is much like shag harbor everybody has a theory and oak island's theories it's almost like a religion there are people who you know stand who who would put their life on the line to prove their theory right and i i don't know if i could even express how into oak island some people are. Um, I know people who are almost scary to talk to when the topic of Oak Island comes up because they are so invested in it. Some of the most intense people I've ever met are people related to Oak Island in some way because it kind of brings out the the it brings out the passion in people. If you're into mystery and intrigue and treasure and you have a lot of free time on your hands, uh, if you jump down the Oak Island rabbit hole, you may never come out because <laughs> there there is so much written about it and it goes in so many directions and there are so many personalities. It seems like Oak Island can suck in people, but it seems to favor they, – they actually – one of the – people heavily involved in Oak Island. His name is Charles Barkos. He lives just off the island, and he is um, on the TV show. He's known as the historian. But he uh, came up with this the term Oak Islanditis, and he basically says, you know, if you get into it, you catch Oak Islanditis, and, you know, for the rest of your life, you're going to be into it. But it seems that the island will infect the most interesting people with Oak Islanditis. So in turn, what ends up happening is, yeah, the the history and the the mystery is deep, but it's also speckled with these interesting characters that are kind of like nobody else you've heard of. It's uh, yeah, it's just a fascinating place and a fascinating story. Um, maybe there's nothing down there, and even if there isn't anything down there, uh, it's still an incredible story. Has that, anything of real importance been found there yet? I know they seem to keep digging up trinkets and a chain here and there and things mm -hmm. like that, but did, did they ever come up with something that really seems to sell them on this mystery yeah well i've seen a lot actually there's um on the television show they they haven't found anything significant they found a few coins and you know sh uh, little scratches of metal and stuff but when you actually go to the island there's um they i think they call it the interpretive center or i would just call it a museum there's a big building on the island where they display a lot of the uh, artifacts that had been dug up over the last probably 30 or 40 years, which is the, the current um, 
guy who owns the majority of the island. Um, his name is Dave and Dan Blankenship. It's a father-son team. Uh, it's basically everything that they've dug up during their roughly 40 years living on the island. And it's all under glass, uh, so you can see the artifact, and it will include a little card that tells you where on the island they found it and how deep it was under the ground. Because, again, what the people are doing is digging. But what they find, it's not that it's stuff of value, but it's stuff that makes you scratch your head and say, what the hell was that doing, you know, 180 feet under the ground, that sort of thing. So an example would be um, one of the things that they found, It's it was – uh, a link of chain. It's actually three pieces of chain, or like three, you know, circles of chain. But it's it's not like it, like not like the kind of chain you would go with to buy. It's obvious that somebody, you know, with probably like a hammer and a lot of heat built this, and like by hammering it together, whatever. But this piece of chain they found, I think, it, I think the depth was a little over two hundred feet below the ground. So. F- For me, I just, I can't understand what natural process would bring a piece of chain 200 feet underground. To me, that's a, that's a mystery. Um, some other things they found was, um, a a pair of scissors, uh, that are, again, not like any scissors I've ever seen before. It was obviously, like hand forged or whatever, like, you know, who knows how old they were, but these scissors as well, I think we're a little over 70 feet under the ground. So if, if you're digging, and that's very deep, if you're digging that deep and you're finding man-made objects on an island that should not have been inhabited for more than probably 100 or 200 years, it just doesn't make sense to me why that, what natural process would put that down there. Well, but is this again, an island, yeah, is this an island that... Um you know, people used and, and would camp on while they were, you know, sh- shipping off to other places or out exploring? Could they have just made it a dumping ground? Yeah, it could have been. And once upon a time, um, alcohol was illegal and there was all the rum runners what? who were. You, yeah, that was uh, a dark time. They called it the dark ages, <laughs> but it's. Uh, um, they uh, a, a lot of uh, bootleggers were would hide stashes of alcohol on these small islands in and around Oak Island, and then you know at night they would on a small little fishing boat or whatever canoe or something they'd go grab it and bring it in. So a lot of the the pirate lore around my part of the country is stems from these type of rum runners people you know uh, bootleggers hiding hiding alcohol and whatnot and moving it around so some people think you know it, this could have all started with you know something like that but it's not an island that has any type of industrial or like uh, boat building history but who knows it could have once upon a time been a spot where you know you'd pull your boat up and they'd rebuild it for you or whatnot there's also um Without getting too deep into it, there's a one of the theories is that there is a it, that it was an ancient pine tar operation, and I guess what that is is that there's a lot of pine trees here. But what they would do is to get this certain type of tar out of the the pine trees is you would just cut a bunch of the pine trees down, pile them up, and set it on fire. Once the fire uh, dies out, what you do is you dig in the ashes underneath all the trees and you find this sort of like tar that would seep out of the trees as the fire was happening. But it was also created a lot of pollution. So what they would have done back then is they pile trees up, light it on fire, dig it out, put more trees on, light it on fire, dig it out. And then over a period of 20 or 30 years of doing that, what you're left with is just uh, – almost looks like a mine it's just all dug out and dirty and you know and maybe years later they just come and backfill the whole thing and maybe that's what's going on so some people believe what we could be what all these people could be digging and dying for is just uh, evidence of a basically a prehistoric pine tar operation <laughs> so yeah that takes kind of the excitement and mystery out of it then doesn't it yeah, but you kind of got to think of both sides. It, it could be the Knights Templar uh, hiding, you know, the some of the uh, religious, uh, the, the most precious religious artifacts could be buried there, mm-hmm. or it could be a bunch of people who are just mistaken, <laughs> mistaking uh, a natural uh, occurrence. So it's, you know, you got you kind of have to look at both sides. But it's, uh, yeah, I don't, I'm on the fence about what it is. 
Well, Jordan, thank you so much for joining us and spending some time this evening to talk about the Shag Harbor incident and some of the other cool and bizarre pieces of your history out there. We really appreciate it. That was my pleasure, Dave. I appreciate your show. It's the the amount of work you put into it. Uh, it's the quality is always fantastic, and you make podcasters like me jealous. Where I'm, I feel like I work for two weeks straight to put out an episode, but every time I look at my podcast app, I have three or four new episodes of Beyond the Darkness. So I, I don't know how you do it. I have no life, no life <laughs> at all, Jordan. But that's uh, that's a time that's a talk for another day. Uh, thank you so much, yeah, and, and we'd love to visit with you more, so please come back and let us know, and if there's any cool new findings after the big festival coming up, uh, let me know. I, we'd love an update. I will. I'll do that for sure. I'll be happy to be back, and, and you give my best to Tim. Will do. That's it for tonight. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We'll be back again tomorrow as we wrap up another week here on Beyond the Darkness.